Good morning, everyone. It's always good to be able to bring God's word in this place to these wonderful people that I'm coming to know and love. We are continuing in our sermon series that we're calling The Transformed Life. And, um, and this morning, the topic is the church. Now, think with me for a moment, if you will. When I say the word church, think of people you know that have nothing to do with the church. Either that they're, they might be Christian, but they just don't ever connect with the church, or think of people that maybe just, just for whatever reason. Um, but they probably have an opinion about the church, right? Because it's formed from media and all kinds of places. So think of somebody, not yourself, but somebody that has nothing to do with the church. And I want you to call out some descriptive words that they might think about the church. A building. Boring. Hypocritical. Prejudice. Self-righteous. Ooh, lovely words. <laughs> I asked my son, and he said, well, my friend would call it a cult. Um, now I want you to think yourself. When I say the word church, what descriptive words come to your mind about church? Small group? Family? God's gift? Worship? Community, maybe? Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me, uh, it's been interesting to me all week, actually, as I've been thinking through this scripture text. Nobody said the word holy. But as I read the scripture, what you're going to hear is that Peter is, is going to say that the church is God's holy people being built into a spiritual house. I'm reading from uh, 1 Peter, the second chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, see I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe he's precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Holy, holy, holy God. We're here because we want to see you. And we want to hear your voice. So would you unstop our stopped up ears and our colluded eyesight? And would you speak? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable as well, Lord, in your sight. Amen. The language that Peter is using in, in uh, this passage of scripture 
the language that he's using for the church is the language that God used for the people of Israel. And you, you see this language in various places in the Old Testament. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. What Peter is saying here is that the church is the fulfillment of the, and the continuation of the nation of Israel. By God's grace and God's grace alone, Gentiles, as well as Jewish believers, are God's own people. It's nothing short of a miracle, I think, <laughs> that our holy God, in whom there is no impurity at all, would choose this messy, impure group of people to be his very own. This is our identity, friends. No matter what the world thinks, our identity is that we are God's very own people. And the language in this scripture, all the way through the scripture that I just read, is the yous are all plural, y'all. Y'all are the church, not a building. Y'all are the church. Turn to uh, somebody near you and, and just say, you all are the church. Y'all are the church. Y'all are the church. You're chosen to belong to God, yes, and this is very important, very countercultural, not just to God, but you're chosen to belong to one another. You're chosen to belong to one another. In the Old Testament, the, the dwelling place of God was the temple. But since Jesus rose from the dead and gave his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, dwells within his people. I just kept thinking about that word holy. Paul says in verse 9, you, you're a holy nation, the church is. The, in verse 5, he said, we're a holy priesthood. Now, be honest. When you think of the church, do you think holy? Churches that I have pastored over the last 39 years have all been messy. Now, there have been marvelous things about them as well. But the messy dwells with the marvelous in every church that I know of, and certainly the ones that I've known well. Church I, I was with several years ago, major leaders in the church had extramarital affairs on their spouses with each other. It was messy. People just act immaturely, sometimes talk immaturely. And I'm not talking just young people. I'm saying you can be old and be immature. And if I'm honest, you guys, I have painful memories of when I've been part of the immaturity. I had a staff person once who was jealous of the relationships that I had with some other people and and she yelled at me one day, I want to be your favorite. Had a, a man in the, the church who was quite influential come into my office one day with a, a list of expectations. You might call them demands. And, uh, and he said, I just want from God and my church what I deserve. Ooh, no, you <laughs> don't want what you deserve. <laughs> you don't want what you deserve. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that at the very beginning of this chapter where P 
Peter's been glowing language about the church. In verse 1, it starts out, rid yourself, therefore, of all malice and guile and insincerity and envy and all slander. It was messy. So how can he say that we're holy? We are holy for one reason. Our holy God has chosen us and has created us and has set us apart for his holy purposes. And his Holy Spirit sustains us and is at work forming and transforming us. Individually, yes, but us. And I, I'm going to use the word church all through this message. Sometimes I'll be talking about the local church, the small C church, and sometimes I'm going to be talking about the big C church, the church universal. Hopefully you can tell by the context what I'm talking about when I'm doing it. Holiness only exists where Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, period. Period. The cornerstone in those days was the first stone. It was chosen carefully, and around that stone, everything else was built. Any time in a local church when Jesus Christ is not the cornerstone but something else, they've built around something else, maybe even good things, but if it's not Jesus, they're not the church. It ceased to be the church. The cornerstone was laid 2,000 years ago in a stable in Bethlehem, and it was a messy birth. And our Lord Jesus lived to show us how much God loves us and, and how far God would go to bring us back to himself. He died a horrible death on the cross. The church finds its salvation in the bloody mess of the cross. When he ascended, for some reason that I don't know that I'll ever understand, he chose to leave his work in the hands of his church. And the church has always been messy. Just read the New Testament letters. It goes way back to the beginning. The church is holy because our Lord is holy. And the church is where his Spirit is at work um, he's in the in the in the uh, in the church at work building a spiritual house building a holy priesthood let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Priests in the Old Testament were the only ones who had direct access to God, and they were the ones that mediated between God and ministry to the people. But again, after Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within the church, and every person has direct access to God through the Spirit that lives within me or you. And We are priests to one another. We are part of of the, the priesthood of God. All of us are. I am. I want to jump out of this priesthood for um, image for a moment and tell you another image that I think is a beautiful image, um, and it's related. It's an image that Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses when he talks about the church. And he calls us the body of Christ, that the church is the body of Christ and each member is a a part of that and has certain gifts. And the body only functions properly when every part of the body is functioning in a healthy way and uh, then the body itself advances the mission of Christ. Together, the body does that. I was... uh, listening to a podcast called Good Faith this last week. And, um, and in it, David French and Curtis Chang were um, answering questions that listeners had sent in. And I guess the most 
frequently asked question went something like this. I haven't been to church in, in a bunch of years, but I'm thinking about going back. Do you have any advice for me on finding a good church? And French said, you know, implied in that and avoid the crazy ones. <laughs> now, I, uh, I first thought to myself, honestly, you can probably avoid the crazy ones, but you'll never be able to avoid the messy ones. Now, if I first heard that question, and I, that, the cynical part of myself just really reacted. I almost didn't listen to the rest of the podcast because I thought, that is such a consumer culture question. It's like, you know, how do, uh, how do I find a good Mexican restaurant nearby? Or <laughs> how, do I, how do I find a good CrossFit gym, you know? How do I find a good church? It's, uh, it, we are consumers, and we think consumers, even when we're thinking church, right? But as I listened to their answers, I was glad I, I stayed tuned in. I liked the, some of the advice. They said we were made for each other. Our gifts, our talents, our hurts, our wounds are there for a reason. Not just for ourselves, but for the other. We're the body of Christ. If I'm a foot, I'm not, not just, well, what does the body give me? I'm also there to carry the body and serve it and move it forward. Each of us is a part of the body, in the, in the Apostle Paul's words. In Peter's words, we're, we're a holy priesthood. We're not just there to receive, but to give what we were meant to give. Friends, we are the church, the people, not the building. We are holy priests to each other, and also together we are God's holy nation in a very unholy world. The world Gabby just prayed about. As long as we buy into the increasing individualism of our culture, we will never be fully available for God's holy purposes because it's not all about me. In fact, it's not about me. As long as the church is something to watch, to critique, to uh, rate as to what I get out of it or did I get at something out of it, we, we're, we're always gonna be thwarting God's purposes, always. It's in the context of the church that we're taught how to love one another, be kind to one another, be patient with one another. All those one another's that run throughout the, the New Testament, it's in, in the context of the church, friends, that we're formed and transformed into people that look more and more like our holy God. Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. Let yourselves. That implies you have a choice. Um, I'm going to put that on hold. I'll come back to that. Let yourselves be formed into a spiritual house. A spiritual house. A house that is continually formed and transformed and filled with God the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit makes us holy, and, and Peter lifts up two purposes um, of the church in this passage, and I want to briefly look at both of them. One is uh, that we're to offer spiritual sacrifices, and that's the one that I'm going to speak about first, and then I'll take us to the second one. When the gospel spread from town to town as the apostles um, would travel, and in every town, people would respond and then there would be believers, and they would form churches in each one of these little communities. And they would have elders that would oversee the health and the growth of the community. And, um, and they continued to practice weekly worship. We know this from, from church history, that the Jewish practice was weekly worship, and the, and the church just continued that, although they moved it from Saturday to, to Sunday, which was the day of the resurrection. And 
we know from church history that they do a lot of the things that we do even here. They sang spiritual songs. They listened to a teaching. They prayed the prayers of the people. Much of what we do today. Peter Davids, the theologian, says that probably corporate worship was in mind when Peter wrote those words, spiritual sacrifices, because, spirit, because sacrifices were offered in Jewish, t typically in the context of Jewish worship. And even though we're not, after Christ, we don't offer animal sacrifices, we still um, offer spiritual sacrifices every time we gather together. We offer the spiritual sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. We offer the, the sacrifice of our pride on the, uh, at the cross, and we, and we bend our knee humbly, and we listen to God's word. We come to the table knowing our need for repentance and for forgiveness. Friends, I'm going to say something that might make you mad. Maybe not you in this room, but it make a lot of people mad that you know. And that is, for a Christian, weekly corporate worship is not optional. Paul and Peter, they just, they wouldn't have known any other life than this is how you function. Community groups, vital. Every other thing that we were talking about in this series, transformationally, all of it's important. None of it is a substitute for gathering weekly with the community. It's there that we offer our praises to God. It's there that we re we're reminded every time we meet that, again, it's not just about me, or it's not just about me and my special group of friends. It's bigger than us. It involves people that aren't like us. I, every time we're on vacation, it's our practice always to go to worship wherever, wherever we are. And man, I'm always imp impressed when I'm in a place. I don't even know these people's names. And I'm connected to everybody. They don't look like me. They might not sing one song I know. But as long as we are praising God, I'm in the right place. As long as God's name is lifted high and mighty. It's not just me and God. It's me and everybody else that's worshiping him at the same time. And he hears our praises. I'm going to call her Karen. <laughs> I didn't choose that name. I just realized why you laughed. <laughs> I just, yeah. Well, anyway, I am going to call her Karen. Um, <laughs> Karen, um, Karen would say, if you talk to Karen, she would say that a long time ago, many, many years ago, she was hurt by or offended by the church. Um, which always, I always push back when somebody says that to me. You were not hurt by the church universe or BC church. You probably weren't even hurt by every single person in the local church, wherever you were. But you were, I, I've been hurt by individuals in church. I mean, I know how painful that is. Anyway, Karen just gave up on church after that. Now, in, in this case, Karen didn't give up on Jesus. A lot of times when people give up on the church, they give up on, on Jesus and the whole bit. But Karen... Karen loves Jesus. She would say she loves Jesus. She just doesn't love the church. And she practices uh, her faith in, by herself, essentially. Karen would not say this, but I'll tell you that her soul is withering. And you can walk around a long time with a withered soul, but it's not the same as being fully alive in Christ. There's a lot we can do with, with our Lord individually, but there's some of it we can't do alone. 
and because we're meant to be in community. The, the body of Christ, the holy priesthood that we're created to be, is weakened because Karen isn't there. And she's not participating. And so we're weaker. She practices an individualistic faith. And I can just tell you that in God's economy, there is no such thing as a person who's a Christian who is not actively a part of the church. That's an American individualistic cultural thing, but it's not in the scriptures. Only God is holy. His church is messy. It's a work in progress. And it's the work of the Spirit, God's Spirit in the church, that makes what is impossible without him possible. That we become more and more holy, like our God who is holy, who is at work within us, transforming us. In his book on holiness, John Webster notes four ways that we see holiness, that holiness is visible. One, it's visible in our obedience. When we obey God, that's a sign of his holiness at work in us. Two, our humble acknowledgement of sin and prayer for forgiveness. There's no greater sin than the Christian church loses there. No greater sinner, sorry, than the, than the Christian church. Three, our prayer, hallowed be thy name. The church is holy as we magnify God and we worship his name. And four, our testimony and our good works, which declare the wonderful deeds of our, of our holy God. Our purpose offers spiritual sacrifice. The other purpose that Peter lifts up here is our witness to proclaim the mighty acts of God who delivered you from darkness into his marvelous light. Our purpose is to proclaim with our mouth and with our deeds, the good news of the gospel. Evangelism, in word and in deed, is a team sport. We do it together. Your gifting and my gifting and his gifting and her gifting, and it, it's a team sport. Thank God it's a team sport. Thank God it's not all up to me. A few years ago, Kitty was uh, stopped at Fry's on her way to worship. And she was walking out of Fry's to get in her car. She had her groceries. She had her two kids. And this homeless man stopped her and started visiting with her. And um, something in her heart began to stir. And... She said, I don't normally put strange homeless men in my car by myself with my kids. But she said, I, the Holy Spirit was just telling me to do it and bring him to worship. So she invited him. He got in her car. She brought him to worship. They, they got there a little bit early. And so she, she introduced him to us, and she introduced him to a few people. I think some people were very kind. I think some people probably... Um, turn the other way. It's, I tell you, it's a, it was a messy church. I mean, they all are. But there, but there were some real kind things that were happening, I could tell. And um, he sat there through worship. He heard the gospel in the music. He heard the, in the words, the songs he was hearing the gospel. He heard the gospel in the sermon. He heard the gospel as we called people to come to the communion table. Uh, he, he heard it from, I think I was preaching that day. I can't remember but he heard it from things that I said, from what the worship leader was saying, from what, in Kitty's presence with them, 
um, whoever prayed, he was hearing and he was connecting with God. After worship, we invited people to come forward to pray and I see them coming up. And um, I don't remember who was standing there. With, uh, were you there that day? Yeah. Um, some, some of us were, there was more than me. I, I just don't remember who was standing there. And um, we had the opportunity to ask him some questions. We found ways to tell him how much God loved him. Um, talked to him about hope, I think. And at one point, he had me hold out my hands. He wanted to put something in my hand. And can you put that picture up? This is what he put in my hand. And he closed my hands over it, and he said, I want to stop smoking meth. Will you throw this away? And will you pray for me? And we laid hands on him, and we prayed for him. I think we prayed mightily for him. And afterwards... Somebody that was standing there um, had called a motel, and we put him up in a motel for the night. And the next morning, somebody else in the congregation showed up and brought him breakfast and lunch and, um, and then took him to an agency that we partnered with. And um, we knew that if, if, he would, if he would go there, they'd, they'd help him get off the streets and help him change his life. I wish I could tell you that I have a, a, know the end to the story because I, I don't know much more than that. I, I tried to find him. I couldn't find him. I'm not sure he stayed with the program. I don't know. I don't know if he gave his life to Christ and if he's following Christ today or if he's back on the streets. What I do know is that night, we experienced holiness. Let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. Let yourselves. You have a choice. You don't do the building. Christ does the building. Can you see that the Spirit is at work making this into a spiritual house? Do you know that the Holy Spirit is building holiness in you that he's not done? He's not finished yet? Do you want that? Peter says, if you reject Christ and you reject the things that he said are true about you and the world, you will stumble over that cornerstone and you will fall. But if you accept it, if you accept him and that which he says is true, y'all will stand. And nothing will shake y'all down. Choose to let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. God's holy people. Would you pray with me?